Shir on Likut Sikhas Helik Yutas, the Sikha of Shoftim, the second Sikha. Begins in reference to the Pasuk in our Pasha Shaftim that a people about these are the laws incumbent upon a king that the king should not return the people to Egypt. In other words, he shouldn't have uh, too many horses. So this way, he shouldn't bring the people back to Egypt. Horse, uh, uh, Egypt was a place known for its for its horses. So if he has more than the horses that he requires for his chariot, then this may lead to doing, uh, I guess, commerce with Egypt, going down to Egypt and living in Egypt. And Hashem said to you, continues the Pasuk, you shall not continue, like Teisifun, you should not continue to come back, Loshuv, to return in this way forevermore. In other words, don't ever go down to Egypt. And this, a halacha that's derived from this is, that a Yid is not allowed to go to settle in Egypt. And more than that, Chazal tell us, um, in, the, in the Yerushalmi, in the Mechilte, Chazal tell us, our sages tell us that in three places the Torah were warned not to go back to the land of Mitzrayim. In other words, there are three, pro, three times that the prohibition is mentioned. The Rambam, in his book of Halacha, Siyad HaChazaka, he brings this Halacha, and he says, now I have to live in Egypt. And he also brings this saying of Chazal that three times in three places the Torah warned against going back to Egypt. However, from the um, from the language where he doesn't specify, it appears, and we can infer that this also applies now. It doesn't, doesn't say that this only applies in a certain time. And that's why we find in the commentaries of the Rambam a great discussion back and forth how the Rambam himself lived, was allowed to live in Mitzrayim. And in general, there were many Jewish communities in Egypt. So the Rebbe leaves this uh, actually in a... Um, the Rebbe leaves this, this is in a square brackets. Um, but the Rebbe says that the fact that it also applies now, that's why many of the later commentaries discuss back and forth how the Rambam could have lived in Egypt. The Rebbe quotes here, the commentaries that discuss, he quotes various commentaries, but in this particular sikha, the Rebbe doesn't answer the Rambam. This is, this is going to deal with another nuance of this topic. So we have to understand, when we talk about getting married, there's a, the Torah says a person is not allowed to get married, a Jew is not allowed to get married to an Egyptian, till the third generation. We're talking, in other words, once, obviously a Jew is not allowed to get married to a non-Jew. But even if a non-Jewish Egyptian became converted to Judaism, became a halachic Jew, that person is not allowed to marry within the Jewish community till three generations, till there's already a grandchild after the conversion, and that becomes eligible to marry within the Jewish community. So they're full Jews if they converted, but they can't get married within the Jewish community. So the Rambam says that this doesn't apply anymore. Why? Because when Sancheirev, the king of Assyria, who came and he had a world conquest, he mixed up all the nations. This was his policy. He mixed the nations so they shouldn't uh, be, be uh, able to uh, create a rebellion against him. He mixed them all with each other and he exiled them from their particular locales. We're talking about all the, all the nations of that region. And the Egyptians, therefore, that are now in Egypt, they're not the same people that were there when the Torah was talking about not marrying an Egyptian till the third generation. He says... The Rambam. Since they were already mixed up, they're not the same Egyptians, they have other nations mixed into them. So now, anyone that comes from that mix-up, from that um, Egyptian um, uh, mix, with his mix, which is mixed with other people, is permissible right away. If they're Jewish, if they're converted, they're permissible to marry within the community. Why? And here's the key statement we have to pay attention to, which the Rambam says, anybody who separates from that people that currently lives in Egypt, anybody who separates themselves from that community, the Egyptian community, to convert, we assume that they are 
a um, they have separated from the majority that's to be found there, and the majority that are to be found there are not Egyptians, are not original Egyptians. So since in our times in Egypt, this is a, a, a mix, it's a country of other people that don't trace their lineage directly to the um, original Egyptians. So therefore, marriage from to, to a uh, convert from Egypt is permissible. You don't have to wait three generations. If I so ask the Rebbe, why can't you go back to Egypt now? It's not the same Egypt. So on the one hand, the Rambam says you can get married to somebody who converts from the Egyptian people, because it's not the same Egyptians. On the other hand, it says you, know, you still can't go live there. Base. We would, it would seem that we'd be able to answer, as some commentaries indeed do say, that the prohibition to live in Egypt has got nothing to do with the people of Egypt. It's got to do with the land itself. The land in Egypt, even just the land, is creates a prohibition. That's what the Torah prohibits. And this seems to be the, the point from also from the Pasuk, the Rambam. The way he says the halacha is, it would appear to me that if a Jewish king conquered the land of Egypt according to the Sanhedrin, according to the court of law, which is permissible, and then it would be permissible to live in Egypt. The Torah said that individual Jews should not go and live there, while it still is in the hands of the non-Jews. Why? Because the deeds that take place in Egypt are worse than all the other countries. What, is, what does this seem to say? That the, the, the prohibition is because of the deeds of the land of Mitzrayim. And it's not the deeds of the actual non-Jews living in Egypt. It's the land somehow that influences the deeds of those that live there. We have this, we have this uh, um, before. When, um, when the Jewish people were asked to send, asked to send Miraglim, and Moshe Rabbeinu gave a checklist of what to look for. Um, is that where, I'm not sure if that's where it is. Sorry, I'm not sure where this Chazal is. Um, anyway, there's a saying in Chazal that there are, in, there are various springs, in other words, countries that have springs of water that um, develop certain kinds of people. In other words, people that grow up in a land are a product of the actual land. There are some lands, continue our sages then, that say, that raises people that are engrossed and uh, steeped in immorality. There was, there's some kind of, a, uh, of, of, a, of, a, um, of an energy to the land which uh, creates a certain feeling or a certain behavior pattern amongst the people living there. <clears throat> That's why the Ramam says like this, if the Jewish people conquered Egypt, so then they changed the whole reality. But if it's still a land that's in the hand of non-Jews, even if they're not Egyptians, but that land, without an overt presence of holiness overcoming it, that land is not a place for the Jews can go. It's a, it's a place that creates negative deeds. And you're not allowed to live there. That's, that's what it seems to be. So if that's the case, and that's why if a Jewish king, if a Basedin says to go and conquer, so then what happens is that the borders of Israel then broaden and they incorporate whatever was conquered. And that becomes like Israel for everything. In other words, the conquering would actually create a change in the essence of the land and therefore wouldn't be prohibited to live there anymore. So, um, bup, 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 bup. However, it's not so clear. And that would answer for us why you're not allowed to live in Egypt. Even though the Egyptians aren't the same Egyptians, but Egypt is still the same land. It hasn't been trans, hasn't been Egypt has not been conquered. It hasn't been um, transformed to a Jewish place. So that would remember, we're trying to reconcile why. On the one hand, Ramam says you're allowed to marry an Egyptian who converted because they're no longer the original Egyptians, even if they if they were the original Egyptians, you would have to wait three generations. On the other hand, Ram says you're not allowed to live in Egypt. Well, if they're not original Egyptians, why not? So we're trying to say here that maybe it's got to do with the land. However, it's not so simple to say. And if it's got to do with the land, then it could be other people, not the same Egyptians. But so long as you don't have a transformative Jewish conquering of Egypt, any non-Jews that live in Egypt, Egypt will still be a prevalent force of negativity and create negative deeds. So Jews shouldn't live there even if it's not the original Egyptians.
But that's not so clear to make this distinction because Rambam in Sefer Mitzvah, in the book of Mitzvah, he writes that the reason for the prohibition of going to Egypt is we shouldn't learn from their deeds. In other words, it's not got to do with um, learning from the people of Egypt. So one second, to say, which means to say, uh, the, the prohibition is not to learn from the people of Egypt, their deeds. So we would still need to understand why if it's not Egyptians, why are we so worried? We're not learning from the original Egyptians. And also, even if you want to say it's the country that produces such people, um, so what about when Egypt is desolate? It says that the halacha is, it says even when Egypt is desolate, Um, if, if it applies even when Egypt is desolate, for example, it's got to do with the country, the land, then it would apply even if nobody's living there. So then it should be even at the time where nobody's there. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, and what? And it appears that... Um, It appears that, that the Navi is saying once, I'm not sure, but it appears that once there's no people there, once it's desolate, it appears that there's no prohibition. But if it's got to do with the actual country that produces negativity, then why would that change if there was no people there? I'm not clear on this last paragraph. Gimel, about the prohibition to come and marry within the community for an Egyptian, with the terrorist says you have to wait three generations, so the Levush writes the following words. He says, when did this prohibition apply? That was in the earlier generations when they were original Egyptians. However, today, after Sanchev came and he mixed up the people, he put other people in their place, then it doesn't apply. Even though, says the Levush, that definitely a, my, a, um, a minority of original Egyptians did stay in their place. Not everybody was uprooted. There is a minority. So here we employ the, the, the teaching one of the one of a, 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 a the Gemara derives this, but this is the, the rule that comes out of, of the Gemara. That when something is kavua, when something is in its original place, and there's a doubt, it's like half half. I'll soon explain this context this concept. Uh, let me explain it right now. Um, the, the classic case is if there are nine um, if there are nine stores selling kosher meat and one selling non-kosher meat and i see so now that's a reality we know there's nine non nine kosher one non-kosher and i see somebody going to a store buying meat i don't know which store he went into can i say well the majority is it's 90 percent kosher it's probably kosher no because it's there because there's a there's a reality there it's called kavua there's something fixed we know that that fixed scenario has a uh, has a 10% chance of being non-kosher because there's a non-kosher shop there, the whole thing becomes like half-half. And if it's half-half, <laughs> what do you have to do when there's a doubt, a half-half doubt? you got to go and be machmi. You have to go to the stringent. If it's non-kosher, you can't say, oh, maybe it's kosher. No, no, no. If maybe it's not kosher, it's not kosher. What happens if now, by the way, don't don't uh, make your own halachas based on this. I'm just giving you the Gemara concept. When you have a shayla, you go to a law. Now what happens if I find a piece of meat? I didn't see somebody go buy it. A, uh, a dog is uh, carrying a piece, of, a package of meat in its mouth. It's packaged. It looks good. The seal is still intact, but it doesn't say from which store it came. But now I don't know. There's nine kosher stores. There's one non-kosher store. This has already separated. It's now no longer. We no longer have. It's no longer within that reality of the nine and. and Nine out of ten stores. It's now been. It's called Polish. It's separated. Uh, once it's separated, I, I look back and say, one second. This. I now follow the majority. There's nine kosher, one non-kosher. I'm going to look at this piramid that's already no longer. It didn't. It didn't come from one of those in front of my eyes. It's already been separated from its origin. Now I go after the majority. Uh, to give you the the, te the terminology of the Gemara. Kol, kavua, anything that's fixed is kemechzal mechzal, that's like half-half. It's, you know, and, and therefore we have to be machmer, right? Well, the parish, once it's separated from that, that original suffix, then we say meruba parish, it's separated from the uh, majority.
somehow the Lavush is applying this logic here to the people that are living in Egypt. There's definitely a minority that stayed in their place. However, somebody that's converting, he's obviously removed himself from that, right? From that scenario. Now we see him. Oh, you're a converted person. Where did you come from? From the majority, right? We'll elaborate a little bit more. This, this is a key concept. We'll, Rebbe will take this and develop this and elaborate more. According to this, minority still stayed in place, even after the, the, the people were mixed up. So now we understand why you're not allowed to live in Egypt, because they're still original Egyptians, and they don't become bottled. They don't become uh, absorbed by the majority of non-Egyptians. Because, remember, there's a rule. If you go to the actual place, they didn't, they're not removed from that reality where we say follow the majority. They're in their fixed place. So fixed place, it's half-half. And if they're still considered half-half, we've got to go with the stringency that, yeah, there's also half Egyptians. We can't live there. Once they come to get married, they've moved. Now we can follow the majority. Majority are not the original Egyptians. However, we have to understand why does the Rambam say, and also the Shukhanar says, that a ger, an Egyptian convert, is immediately permissible to get married to a Jewish girl. Why? Because he comes from the majority. The majority is not the original Egyptians. Um, what about the fact that a minority are in their places? Shouldn't, therefore, we have said, depends. If you go to Egypt to get married, oh, wow, then you can't get married. Because there's a, there, there, even though there's no majority, when you go to the fixed reality, there are some Egyptians there. you got to treat it like a half-half. If you, however, it's a comment that's left Egypt, okay, she's left. Now we look at it not in, in its fixed place. Now we said it came from the majority. Right? Um... And there's a parallel here in parentheses that there, there brings us a parallel in the Gemara in Ksubis. I did not look it up, so I'm not going to endeavor to explain it. My apologies. So we could say that when a person converts, so there had to be a separation from their house. Like the Lavush emphasizes, the person that converts separates from, from the community of the Egyptians. However, that doesn't seem to be enough because in our case, it would seem that you have to actually separate yourself from the entire Egypt. And the Rebbe builds, builds his uh, case of this question as follows. In Dalit, the Gemara says in Mesach Yavamas that a non-Jew that gave a Jewish woman, again, don't pass can halachas from this, this is the Gemara, a non-Jew that gave a woman a kiddush, in other words, he betrothed her, we have to be worried. Um, we have to be worried. Maybe there is some reality to this which would require a divorce. Why? Because maybe this non-Jew is from the 10 lost tribes. I want to ask for one second. Don't we have the rule that once something is separated, they are separated from the majority. The majority of, of, of the world population is not 10 lost tribes. So why do I have to think about the minority that is 10 lost tribes and still Jewish? The Gemara says, no. It depends. In the place, we're talking about if a, a non-Jew gave a Jewish woman, Kiddushin, betrothed her in a place where the... Um, we know the ten tribes were exiled to. For example, it says, the Gemara says that it says in the passage, by Yenachem that Hashem, by Yanchem, Hashem led them to a place called Chalach and Chavoir, etc. Those places. Um, so then, as Rashi explains that those are places where there we know that there are at least a, a minority of, of Aser Sashvatim. There, there are Kavua. That we know that they're fixed there, so to speak. They have a permanence there. And if somebody does a kiddushin there and he goes to that place of permanence, it's like half half. We have to be stringent and say, maybe it is from one of the Jewish tribes. And therefore, this woman would need a divorce in order to get married again. Taisva says, however, that in, he doesn't say that there's a minority in the place that they were exiled. And therefore, whenever there's a minority, but if you go to their fixed place, right? We said you have to treat it like half-half. Taisva says, no. In their place, somebody, a non-Jew gives kiddush in their place. In their place, they're the majority. The majority there in those places they were exiled to is from the ten tribes. Not like Rashi says, says Teisvis, that we say that they're in their fixed place. It's like half-half. Because um, if because if he has gone to her, right, so then we would say that he came from the majority. In other words, he's now 
Um, one second. In other words, he left his house and he's now gone and initiated a relation with a Jewish woman. He's left his house. Now he's left. He's not in his place. Ah, not his place. So now we can say he left his majority. The Rashi doesn't say it like that. And it never says we understand what Rashi doesn't say like that. Because even though Rashi, in that Gemara and Ksubis I didn't go into, Rashi says there that when a person leaves his house, it's also considered a leaving his place of permanence. And therefore we could talk about him coming from the majority. But that doesn't fit with the language of the Gemara. The language of the Gemara says, when do we say that a non-Jewish man who gave a Jewish woman Kiddushin? We have to be worried. It says the Gemara in a place where they are fixed, where they are permanent. In other words, the place where Hashem sent the exile ten tribes to. According to Teisves, it should have said in a place where they are a majority. It's got nothing to do with them being fixed in that place. But the fact that the Gemara says the fact that they are fixed in that place, we understand that this concept is based on the fact that this is their place. And therefore, we need to worry about the Kiddushan, because it could be there from, we have to treat it, mechza, mechza, half is half. What does it mean that they are kavua in their place? The Pesach says that Hashem took them to this place. Once Hashem took them to this place, and that Hashem doesn't mention individual houses, He mentions the locale. That entire locale becomes, not just their homes, that entire locale becomes their place. So anywhere in that region where they, we mentioned in the Navi, in the Prophet, where they're going to be exiled to, Hashem took them there, it doesn't matter if they left their homes. It's going to be considered like that's their place of permanence. And that's why Rashi brings the whole Pasuk. Even though the, the, the Gemara already brought the Pasuk. Rashi is emphasizing that because that because the Torah says, because the Prophet said, that Hashem said, I'm going to take him to these lands, anyone in that whole land, even if they left their house, I mean, especially people, when they get married, they leave their houses. But it doesn't matter. Anyone in that region, because that's where the Ten Tribes are. Is going to be considered permanent there. If they're considered permanent, even though we know they're a minority, still we have to treat it like half half. It's half half. It could be a Jewish man, it could be from the ten tribes. We can't just let this woman be non married and say, no, it was a non Jew and the marriage doesn't count. Maybe it was from the ten tribes. So, according to this, in our case, let's go, let's bring it back. Um, if, the, if the prohibition is the fact that, that we're talking about an Egyptian, and the, the Egyptian name goes in the entire land of Egypt. So it would, see, it would seem that even if he left his house, it doesn't matter. If he hasn't left Egypt, it should have a law of being treated as a place of permanence. The whole Egypt is the place of Egyptians. So even if, if, the, the front, if now there's only a minority of original Egyptians, but when a place of permanence, we treat it like half-half. Um, and this would be, even according to Teisvis, should be the case, because um, because when Teisvis said that when somebody leaves their home to get married, now we have to treat them like they're coming from the majority, it only has to do with this particular case of the ten tribes. And because the fact that they're there has nothing to do, there's no prohibition about the Kiddushin, there's no relation between the place and the Kiddushin. Here, what's the whole prohibition of an Egyptian marrying before three generations, even if they're converted? Because they're an Egyptian in Egypt. So there even Teisvis would say it's not allowed to leave your house. If you're in Egypt, then you're in your fixed place. If you're in your fixed place, then, um, then there should be a prohibition. But then we have a question. If there are still a minority of Egyptians in Egypt, Right? But we say, why are you allowed to, why are they allowed to marry after conversion? Why are they allowed to marry the community? Because they've separated from the community and we follow the majority. So the Rambam and the Shulchanan should have said that, that this applies outside Egypt. But if you, if there's a Jewish, if there's somebody converted to Jews in Egypt, they have to wait three generations. Right? So the Rebbe says, hey, we'll understand all this by understanding a, a greater question. As the Orach HaShulchan asks, the Gemara says in the book of, in the Pesach of Nazir that a woman is considered somebody who's permanent. She's not considered somebody who's um, mobile. Why? Because the, the, the status quo, quoting the, the verse of Shleim HaMelech, the honor and respect of the daughter of a king is to be discreet and indoors. 
not to be out there in the public. Right? For, for, for a regal daughter of a king, discreetness is a virtue. I believe that applies to what we consider um, Jewish women. Bas Melech, the daughter of a king, she's, her, her natural place is in the home. She's not considered mobile, she's considered, so to speak, um, um, home-oriented. But that's why, with regards to a woman, the halacha is she's like in her fixed place. I asked the Gemara, but what happens if the woman was actually going, doing, let's say, shopping in the marketplace? And there somebody did a kiddush, and there somebody betrothed her. Um, so maybe then she becomes like she's mobile. So he said, no. Even if she's out there doing shopping, since her place, and she's going back home, she's considered to be kavur, she's considered to be in her fixed place at home. If so, if somebody, that tells us, if somebody's going back to where they belong, even when they leave for a short time, they're still considered being fixed in their place. So even if an Egyptian left Egypt to get married, but still you'd have a question. When they go back, if they're planning on going back, if they have a two-way ticket planning going back, so how can we consider that they've separated really, and we can say that they're coming from the majority so they can get married without waiting three generations, but if they're going back, aren't they just like in a fixed place? Vav. So the explanation for this is, is that language of the Rambam. The Rambam says anybody who separates themselves from the community to convert, underline, we say, we assume that they separated from the majority. What does the Rambam say? Anybody that separates from the community to convert? What is that insert of that word? I mean, wouldn't the same halacha be if they separated, you cannot convert? When you're separating, right? So if something is separated from the original place, you look at it as coming from the majority. I mean, the Rambam is adding the word this guy to tell us that what does it mean to separate? Here, separation is not a literal separation, a physical separation. It doesn't mean they left Egypt and left the home. Here, we're talking that conversion means a separation. Conversion, by definition, is a change. The concept of changing can be two ways. You can separate by separating your physical location, going from one place and coming to the next one, and not planning to go back to your original place. And that would be a, a move, a permanent move. Then there can be a permanent move in your state of being. In your reality, in the place, in terms of Allah and Torah and status. Status, according to the Torah, is now totally changed or removed from one status to another status. Like in our case, that beforehand, this person was a non-Jew, an Egyptian, and now through the conversion, they become totally converted, totally changed and transformed to a new reality. And therefore, and this is, and this is <coughs> we said before, what happens if a woman goes out into the market and she's going back, so she's considered still like she's home. Here, there's no going back. If somebody converts, there's no going back. There's no way. Nobody can ever convert away from Judaism back to their initial reality. It's a change in the permanent place. And that's why the Ramam says, the reason is that now the Ramam does not say clearly that it's now a non Jewish Egyptian that converts. Allow the community to get married to a Jewish woman. Even if he finds himself in Egypt, that's different. Even if he's in the same home he grew up in, he's no longer considered a Hua. He got married, he separated, and changed his reality. However, the other, what about the other non Jews? They're still in Egypt. We say they're a minority. It doesn't matter. When you go to Egypt, they're in a fixed place. In a fixed place, even if there's a minority, we treat it as a half apple. Half apple, we can't go live in Egypt. But the original Egyptians are considered at least half, and therefore we can no longer we can't go to their place of being and live in Egypt anymore, even if though there's only a minority of original Egyptians. And now that it goes and, and gives in, in, in square brackets a, uh, some of the nuance of the laws of Jews, let alone the law of things being absorbed and losing their identity to the majority. The minority loses its identity to the majority. So it says, especially that this is a reality that it could be, we can't even talk about the minority being popular, losing its identity. Both in terms of the minority that was being connected, and also in terms of the majority, because of the power to cast out this minority. Why? Because, like, 
one, um, when we say that the minority Egyptian actually want to say that there's less numbers of Egyptians than other peoples that were mixed in by separation. So here we're talking about a qualitative correlation between what the diabetes is. So there, one of the could be so intense that it's like something that people know that there's a law in the law of addiction that something that's cautious, over cautious, something with prominence doesn't lose its identity even in a given environment because it's always there. So if the, if the, if the, uh, the activity of Egypt is so intense, it would come up even in a minority. Number two, who, what are we using to cancel out this minority? Other nations. Other nations who may not actually be in opposition to the negativity of Egypt. Usually, when we talk about, um, usually when we talk about people being canceling out minorities, it's something that's only minority. In other words, you have uh, black and white mixing. You have twenty percent white, eighty percent black. The black will overtake the white, right? Or, or, or. Um, Let's even do it the other way. You have 80% white, 20% black, white will take over the black, right? What was it that 80%? Not really white. In fact, all of it, it blends into black as well. So it's not going to cancel out the black. We'll cancel out the black and we'll still remain black. Right? So if, if, if what's left there are other nations who maybe are not as, as negative as Egypt, but still their behavior is still not the behavior that's appropriate, it's still behavior that's inappropriate. Can't call them because even though there's a certain new minority in Egypt, that majority is not canceled out that minority. <clears throat> Sorry, what is all this? At the end, I said, now I just want to give you a, a, a context. I just said this Tikha in right after the Six Day War. And Six Day War, that we had the Jewish people had the miracle that Israel was uh, uh, lightning victory over the entire uh, Egypt, of course, the Rebbe says that it's the one saying the Sikha back then. What he told is that even in Egypt, now there's a minority of Egyptians, it's still original Egyptians. Now, through this, we have a special inspiration during these days. And to preface this, even though know, everything in Torah is always eternal, for all time, for all places, however, there are some things that remain. Conceptual. In other words, their eternity is in the spiritual realm. You can't, you can't fulfill them. They're not happening right now. And there are some things that are actually still relevant and, and applicable and able to be fulfilled in the physical. Which shows that the eternity is even so strong that it even is in the same reality of the world happening here today in our world. In full view. The Rebbe says this is in our terminology. Says in the person, Esau. Um, we're told, you saw everything I did to Egypt, and therefore now listen to my voice and keep my, my covenant, and you will be to me a special nation from all the nations, a nation of Kohanim, of priests, and a holy nation. And this is understood. The context of follow through there is you saw what I did to Egypt, now be, keep my purpose and be a special nation to me. What's the, uh, the flow? That the seeing what, what the miracle of Hashem did to Egypt is a prelude and a preparation to what it says afterwards. The Sukkim that it says afterwards, I quoted to you from the Sukkim, and then it says, and I brought you to me. Look what I did to Egypt. I brought you to me. I rejected the Egyptians, and I fought them, and I brought you and my Jewish people to me. Now, if you listen to me, keep my covenant, you'll be a special people to me. In other words, it seems to be what the case in, indicated is that we see physically how Hashem makes miracles for them by getting by by, um, by um, doing um, by touching the nation which pain and cause pain what do we do so this arouses in Jewish people that they should strengthen their covenant with Hashem by listening to what Hashem has for them so this we can understand that now in our times we understand things right after the war where we see that Hashem is Bringing, um, bringing um, 
And we know, as we've just spoken at length, that there's at least a minority of some of the same original world and that they serve as one. But in their place, it's in like that bad. Who can serve like the original Israel? So now we see again physically how this verse is being fulfilled. You are seeing what Hashem says when I did the Yitzhak. It's no longer talking about 2,040 years ago. Now we saw it again. So that should therefore arouse within us and elicit the continuation of what it is, the continuation of the process. We saw what it did to Egypt. Now we should have a heightened um, inspiration to fulfill my goals, to fulfill my covenant. Eden should strengthen themselves and fill the Torah mitzvahs and becoming a special nation by being a Muslim, a Spanish, a nation of peace, and a holy nation. This becomes a preparation for listening to the voice. And you know that if you listen to the voice, it's like, oh, what is that you're coming today? If you listen to his voice, if you listen to his voice, all the inspiration you see around us, starting from the six feet long, where we get to the Egyptians in front of our eyes, and saved us from this listening to Hashem's voice. The preparation for the coming of Mashiach, as that Mashiach himself promised when he was asked, When are you going to come? He said, Today, if you listen to my voice, be in the Kodesh Mamish, immediately after.